Okay, uh, we will start the session since it is already six uh, thirty. Uh, I think uh, people can join later as well. So, uh, two questions uh, as usual uh, before I start the session. Uh, is my screen visible and uh, am I audible? Can anyone reply? audible sir okay okay thank you thank you so much uh, uh, screen is also visible right okay yeah visible yeah. okay then then we will start the session so uh, welcome everyone to the week 12 of the course research methodology in natural sciences and uh, my name is arjun i am the one of the ts ts teaching assistants of this course and uh, my contact information is given in this window below in case anyone has any doubts Regarding the sports, you can mail me, or you can approach the Google groups for asking notes. So, um, week twelve. So last week of the course. So uh, I think uh, apart from, I mean, uh, in addition, in change of uh, every day Saturday session, I have instead shifted this to uh, Friday. This actually is a extra session, by the way. So because I'm for the tomorrow Saturday session, I am actually I will actually be doing a course recap. Rather than a week recap, so with this extra session will be extra session. We will be going over a brief recap of week twelve uh, problems and week twelve assignments, and we will be going over a brief recap of week twelve content as well. Whatever lectures we are having in the content as well. So as usual, so I will be going over the some concepts in week twelve, and after that we will be having a short doubts session. Uh, following which we will be discussing some problems from week 12 and after that we will be having a doubt session to end the week 12 session so i'll just get started so if anyone has any doubts in the middle uh, you can directly ask in the chat box or you can unmute your mic and proceed to ask the question so i'll go ahead with week 12's content so week to, uh, till week 11 we were seeing about uh, scientific communication Uh, in the last part of week 10 and in the whole entirety of week 11 we were looking at scientific communication how to write papers how to write journal how to write scientific scientific grants how to make proper scientific presentations so on and so forth and one so the contents from week 11 to week 12 encompass the good aspects of science so those encompass the things that we have to do in order to do proper science Uh, in week 12 content we deal about the misconducts or the uh, bad conducts in science what not can go wrong what practices constitute bad conduct in science so that is what encompasses the majority content of week 12 so initially we saw about uh, research ethics uh, first we saw about aspects of uh, scientific ethics and then we saw about specific hallmarks of science uh, they were like 15 16 criteria of uh, hallmarks of science which we need to like follow um, some of them included like uh, honesty objectivity uh, carefulness openness uh, respect for individual property and etc etc so basically these are qualities which we essentially we need to uh, conduct good science so whatever the work you're doing you need to be honest with it you need to be open with it and you need to address every other question and every other answer with complete objective mind objective thinking so modern science scientific materialism involves objective thinking so any question or any answer that you address should involve some not some sort of a full sort of objective thinking and you also must be uh, respectful towards others intellectual property and you should also be whatever work you are doing you should also have some sort of social responsibility and apart from that you should also uh, kind of uh, publish your work very responsibly you need to keep in mind that many people will be reading your work including people who are just entering science and according to their understanding your publication must be framed and it should be in such a way that everyone can read it and understand it so that mindfulness that thoughtfulness that that's what the responsibility should be there and apart from that you also need to have the quality is certain other certain other social qualities such as non discrimination uh, in a scientific typical scientific environment you need you should not be discriminating people uh, on 
any social economic social backgrounds or economic backgrounds and apart from that you need to have other uh, technical uh, technical competent uh, qualities such as care for animals if your if your experiment involves usage of animals you need to be taking care of those animals and uh, even if you in in such in some cases you will be uh, handling human subjects as well so even in those cases you need to be mindful of those human subjects as well you need to take proper proper care of human subjects many of them we uh, if you do clinical trials you must be wary of their human health so while doing the experiments you must inform them of certain compensations or stuff like that when we are about to do some experiment on them this is to make sure that if something bad happens to them it is to make sure that we will be taking care of them it will not be like uh, if something happens they can just go away if they can just die that is not there is not proper scientific as well as moral uh, integrity in science so some sort of incentives and some sort of care should be given to human subjects as well and finally whatever work we are doing whatever research we are conducting we will be con- we will be collecting a lot of data from that and whatever data we are collecting we need to store it properly we need to maintain that data properly such that if anyone wants to review the data after we are gone uh, mostly uh, the work that you are doing will consist of multiple people in which includes you as the primary author as well as your principal investigator who will be the corresponding author so at many points you will you may be jumping labs from one one lab to another in search of many positions like a phd to a post doc to a professor but your primary investigator the pi will be staying in the same lab so the primary investigator must be handed over all the data before he leaves the lab and whatever data you are having it must be labeled properly such that whenever other person other people come to your lab for reviewing the data your pi must be in a position to give that data for review properly so all the data files should be named and dated and then specified what contents are there previously people used to log all the data in notebooks now it's in a we are in a since we are in a digital de- era all those uh, data must be stored in some form of hard disk and some form of notepad or word document must be uh, we must be processing which will have all the details of whatever data we are having whatever description of whatever data we are having and uh, following that we also i mean the first part was dealing with scientific research ethics good conduct in science the second part of the series, uh, lectures focused on the bad conducts of science what are the research misconducts that can happen uh, the primary so whatever conducts whatever good qualities we are having in science the opposite may, will obviously be bad conducts in science so some of them include fabrication of data so uh, we know we all of all of us will have a bias towards whatever experiment we are doing and sometimes what we do is in order for the data to fall to fall towards our bias biasing what we often tend to do is we tend to fabricate the data or manipulate the experimental conditions such that the data that comes to us will be towards whatever outcome we are desiring so these are actually misconduct in science because science should should be pure science should be uh, single headed or in one uh, or in a headed towards a single way it should not be interfered by any external human beings so such kind of practices such as fabrication or malpractice is considered as a scientific misconduct fabrication and mis- uh, malpractice uh, fabrication and uh, manipulation of data is from our side that can also be fabrication and manipulation from other people as well without our knowledge and that process is called as interference and same thing happens to us as well if we try to change other people's experimental conditions or ruin other people's data that counts as interference which is not technically a good scientific practice so interference is also a bad scientific misconduct apart from that we have uh, plagiarism plagiarism is basically uh, plagiarism is basically copying someone's work and pasting it into our own so for example if we are trying to write a manuscript and then if we are trying to uh, no, uh, note down someone's work copying it and pasting the text as it comes as plagiarism you have to report whatever the other author has done in a much more scientific manner so you can you can quote or you can paraphrase whatever the author has said and then cite the paper but copying it and pasting the text as you, as the work is done is entirely yours is entirely wrong that comes as plagiarism plagiarism sometimes uh, cannot be done i mean uh, plagiarism sometimes can be done from your work as well you can yes, many times it will be done from others work but sometimes it can be done from your work your work as well what we can do is we can copy 
in some, many wrong in some wrong, wrong cases. FFP means uh, so FFP means uh, so uh, mm, so P stands for practices. So FFP means um, so F, uh, I, I kind of forgot what the uh, initial F stands for. FP means fair practices. Yeah. So breach of those fair practices counts as such misconduct. So moving on, so uh, we have interference and we have plagiarism as well. Plagiarism, self-plagiarism also counts as plagiarism. So you can say, you can copy text from your old work and uh, paste them into your new work. So that also counts as cheating because when you publish a work, not only you own the text, the publisher also owns the text at that point of time. So whatever text you are copying from your article, the publisher also owns um, some part of it. So well, during self-plagiarism, it also influences influences or damages the publisher's reputation as well. And that comes as, comes as scientific misconduct. And the final part of process misconduct deals with uh, confidentiality, breach of confidentiality. So maintaining confidentiality is one of the key pillars of research ethics. Confidentiality just means that if you are doing some form of sponsor research, where someone is sponsoring you with money to perform research, then whatever data you are having, whatever experiments you are doing, it will be confidential between the sponsor and yourself and or your lab or the people who in from your lab who are associated with that project. That project will not, uh, that data from the project will not be discussed or shared with any other person other than the sponsor. Initially, I would have told that research ethics also have, should be, uh, openness is also one of the research ethics. Openness just means that outside of any confidential research, any work should be discussed, can, should be or can be discussed with other people and other people should not try to take advantage of it by scooping the work or publish it, publishing any work as their own. So that is openness. Confidentiality means when the sponsor of your research uh, wants to keep the data confidential so that they can uh, take ownership of the data later, then they will demand you to maintain confidentiality about whatever experiments you are doing and it is your duty, it is your responsibility to maintain uh, whatever confidentiality of the data. So whatever data you are collecting, whatever research you are doing, that should be stored properly and that should not be shared or it should not be vulnerable to share with anyone. So that is confidentiality. So this breach of confidentiality uh, without the sponsor's consent, if you plan to share or discuss this data with anyone else who is not involved with the project, then that counts as a breach of uh, responsibility. So that is also one of the scientific misconducts. And after that, uh, these, these are general, the, uh, the first two parts of the lecture dealt with uh, general uh, scientific uh, context and misconducts. And the third and fourth part of the lectures dealt with uh, ethics and uh, misconducts in scientific publication. Uh, apart from doing work, what are the uh, good rules and bad rules are there in scientific publication? So we'll first look at scientific publication, uh, ethics in scientific publication. And I would have already told you about plagiarism. So the first key pillar of ethics in scientific publication would be quoting or paraphrasing any article or any line. So if you want, if you are inspired, if you are, if someone's work has inspired you to do, do this work, and if you want to cite them, you can properly quote their phrase that this person has said this, or you can paraphrase by to paraphrase in another voice from active voice to passive voice or passive voice to active voice by saying that this person has said this, and you can properly cite that work. So there is good ethics, quoting and paraphrasing. And always, while you are studying papers, studying a large volume of papers, it is important for you to take notes from a paper. If this will later help you to cite them properly whenever you are uh, drafting your manuscript. So taking notes from a paper is also a good ethic. The third ethic comes, uh, third ethic which comes is authorship. So before anyone ever starts a work, it's important for all the people who are involved in the project to properly discuss who gets to take their proper authorship of the paper. So whenever there is a publication, there is a huge hierarchy of people involved. There will be a first author who will be mainly responsible for doing all the groundwork. And then there will be the corresponding author who majorly who will be the PI or, or the PI and co-PI. So they will mostly be involved in 
planning the experiments and discussing the data and validating the data for publication. And in between them, there will be second or the third or the fourth or the so on and so forth, who would have done any minor parts of the work. So before doing any project and before planning to write a manuscript, it's important to discuss the role that each person assumes in a project. So uh, before discussing a project, before starting a project, everyone should be clear of who the primary author of the work is, who the secondary author of the work is, and who the corresponding author of the work is. And this is mainly important when the work being done is a collaborative work between two different labs or labs from two different institutes. So in, in these work, data will be shared across two different institutes. And this is hard, hard to hard to maintain uh, when the labs are situated far away, especially in different universities. Therefore, even in the, especially in the situations, it's mainly important to maintain your authorship details. Fourth one is confidentiality, as we discussed earlier. So whenever uh, we are doing some sponsor or system sponsor, it's important to maintain secrecy, secrecy about whatever data or experiment you are doing. And the fifth ethic of scientific publication is to avoid predatory journals. Predatory journals are uh, any other journal apart from the normal journal theory who will be uh, who will be ready to offer you money in exchange for publishing your work in their journal. And predatory journals are generally not uh, encouraged to be published because those are against scientific ethics. Uh, they pretty much solve every other problem using money. So a uh, good ethic is to avoid predatory journals. So now we have looked at ethics in scientific publication. Now we will come to unethical scientific practices with respect to publication. So the first and foremost unethical practice would be to uh, submit the same article in multiple journals and waiting for a common response. This is not a recommended practice because you are just wasting the... So let's just assume that you are submitting the same article in multiple journals and let's just say you are getting accepted in both the journals. So now it, you get to decide whether to proceed with the application or not. And in this case, you are just wait, wasting the time of the other person, uh, wasting the time as well as the resources of the journal where, where you don't want to submit any. So you are just... Uh, submitting it to the other journal because you are, you want to have a safe option. This is not a uh, ethical way to publish science in any journal. So, submission in multiple journals at the same time is not allowed. Submission in multiple journals is allowed only when you submit a paper, it gets rejected and then you can submit it in another paper. Or you submit a paper uh, in a journal, the journal says that they can't submit, uh, your paper might not be valid for this journal because topic is too broad or too narrow, they will suggest alternate journals to submit to and uh, if the journal, if those uh, journals fall under the same publisher, then you can transfer your manuscript to the alternate journals. But that is a good ethical practice. The second unethical practice is publishing articles alone. What does publishing articles alone mean that? So I earlier I said that every project involves multiple people the first author, second author, third author, and the corresponding author, so on and so forth. So, every research article will comprise a minimum of two people, which involves the first author as well as the corresponding author. So, the first author needs the help of the corresponding author because he is basically using the resources of the corresponding author. And sometimes he needs the corresponding author to validate the data of the first author as well. And the corresponding author needs the uh, help of the first author because the first author, first author is the one who is doing all the uh, work in the ground, in the field. Therefore, the, both the first author and the corresponding author are dependent on each other to do any scientific work. Therefore, it is of vital importance to not ignore anyone who is also part of the project. And many a times, if the first author wants to publish the work alone, he or she must get the consent of the corresponding author and then only publish. Similarly, similarly, if the corresponding author wants to publish an article on the own, he or she must get the consent of the first author. And many often you might see some, many of many of the review articles which involve only one author. These might be the cases where the first author or the corresponding author would have got the consent of each other and then publish the article alone because they think they have done much more significant work on the article than the other person. Maybe like 95% of 95% or 96% of the article's work was done by the one author and then the 4%, 3% is just, just, just done by the first author. 
in that case when the author feels that they have done more significant work than the other author they can, they can get the consent of the other author and then once the consent for publicate publishing the article alone is gotten then they can publish it in the journal with their name alone so this is a publishing article alone without any consent is unethical practice you should always get the consent the third unethical practice would be to unnecessarily cite many articles in the paper so every other article would give some piece of information which would be useful for our article or on whose basis we would be citing whose basis we would be conducting the work but it is important to know that in research articles unless or until any article gives a very significant piece of information without which our work won't progress it is not necessary to cite that paper for uh, our work so unnecessarily citing just for uh, reach or publicity should be totally avoided the fourth unethical citing practice is to going public without publishing uh, for example many people when they think they have done a good path breaking discovery or a ground breaking discovery they try to pub- uh, publicize their work by organizing a press conference before publishing the paper in this case the publisher now will be stressed or forced to accept the manuscript into publishing this is not a good scientific practice and this should not be followed as well the la- final and last unethical scientific practice is to not taking proper clearance so to perform uh, let's if your a project involves study of animals or study of human subjects clinical subjects then it is proper to obtain clearances from animal ethics board and human ethics board and if you are doing projects involving infectious diseases then it you have to get the clearance form from the proper board to perform such success such experiments so whatever is in your total research project whatever uh, clearances you need to get from the proper authorities you might need to get it and you might need to attach those clearance forms with the project uh, manuscript before submitting it to a journal and not getting a proper clearance is also one of the unethical scientific practices especially when trying to publish your work so this is what the first four lectures dealt with and uh, in the fifth and sixth part the uh, the lecturer dr shamitra banerji dealt with cases of scientific misconduct where we uh, for we had a 40 minute session of uh, different cases of scientific misconduct and uh, it's also a, like he also took into account uh, to not reveal their personal information just to keep it safe and Main, main the main objective of discussing those cases of scientific misconduct is to come to a ultimate conclusion that uh, science must be performed and propagated in a good manner uh, every scientist who is in the scientific publication who is in the scientific scenario should be uh, should be at least passionate and slightly passionate about whatever work they are doing and they should always keep the ethics and misconducts uh, in mind while doing the scientific work and whatever science we are doing it must be propagated and performed in a good manner without any uh, hiccups so this is the total recap of all the concepts that was conducted in week 12 so i will leave the room for short while till 655 uh, till that we will have a we can have a talk session following which i will proceed to the problem solving session if you people have any doubts you can ask in the chat box or you can open the mic and then we can uh, proceed to ask Hello, sir. Yeah, sure. I'm with it. Hello. Yes, 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 yes. I'm with it. Sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, I was my mic was off. You can go ahead. Sir, uh, I was uh, uh, wondering means uh, how to read a research paper. Are there any tips and tricks so that because we are uh, reading so many news uh, research papers. 
review articles and technical articles and sometime uh, it is very difficult for us to grasp the knowledge and it is also at the same time it is very time consuming as well yes so yes. so uh, could you please uh, just give a brief uh, about how to get the things uh, maximum things uh, in a minimum time summary the paper yeah so uh, reading the research papers can be like constituted into two types so one type is reading the papers uh, belonging to the area you are familiar with and the other like research papers itself can be constituted into two different categories one would be in whatever area you are familiar with and one will not be in whatever area you are familiar with yeah so it will be each one of these categorical papers you need to follow different strategies obviously if you are starting new to research field uh, you need to start reading papers probably slowly you, you can take your time read uh, maybe one or two papers per week so by doing that what you can do is you can uh, not only learn the vocabulary that is being used to uh, write the paper you can also notice the flow how each person each person is trying to write a manuscript and how experiments are designed and how they are uh, uh, formulated and written one this one i mean in my opinion one better way to read a research paper faster would be to try and understand the figures first so uh, obviously the abstract and introduction reading the abstract and introduction should take a lot of time and it is it is not wrong to take a lot of time to uh, read the abstract and introduction but uh, consider let like just let you like uh, let it, let it flow through your mind let be free and then try to read the abstract and introduction what they were try to understand whatever they are doing because the introduction part is the most crucial part in any research article and because once you are familiar with any research area then the materials and methods half of them you will be familiar with you don't even need to skim you just need to skim through all the research part but the introduction area introduction area highlights why they are actually doing the work and that not only helps you to understand the flow of the article that will also give you ideas on how to identify research gaps in the area so take time to read the introduction article and at the first attempts when when you are starting to read papers for the first time take time to also read the materials and discussion and try to focus more on the figures every article will have three or four figures so those figures will form the most important part of the paper that will actually tell them the most important tell you the most important results try to read understand the figure try to see the figure try to understand the figure and subsequently when you start to read five or six papers and you get a gist of whatever you are trying to read in your area uh, you will gradually get the flow so in time what you can do is you can just read the introduction and then you can jump on to the figures automatically you will try to understand the uh, understand the stuff that is being uh, put into to get the results yes and this is for papers which you are familiar with uh, the research area that you are familiar with in the research area that you are not familiar with uh, i will normally suggest to take time to read the papers slowly like there is no faster way to read those papers in the areas which you are familiar with the current in your current area of research uh, the speed you can pick up the speed gradually because you the the more you read the more you faster you will absorb yes sir yes kartikeya how many section exam so uh, we are uh, so we can have the examination doubts in the last part of this lecture but uh, for now they haven't announced any examination pattern or marks system or anything of that sort to us yeah the, they have just told us that there will be a scientific calculator for all of you people we have a lot of mathematical problems as well so people all the people who are attempting, attempting the exam will be offered a scientific calculator i mean the exam is online so, so completely online computer based exam so all of you will be offered a computer based scientific cal- online scientific calculator mm, so we have provided a scientific calculator or not yes yes so yes, yes. 
you will not be provided a physical scientific calculator you will be provided an online scientific calculator along so you will be attending a computer based exam so in that platform itself there will be a button to activate the scientific calculator so you can just click it and then do your work. okay thank you sir yes yes scientific calculator has been shown online i ah ravindra yes ffp yeah i kind of uh, messed up with the definition and uh, abbreviation yes is yes, falsification falsification or manipulation uh, fabrication and plagiarism so what about the z chart t chart and chi square chart will they be given in exam so for now they have told us that they will be given in the exam uh, but uh, my suggestion would be that uh, you like most of the problems you won't be needing uh, a perfect z z chart t chart and chi square chart and in most of the problem i would suggest you people to remember the standard deviation values that is required for uh, 90% confidence interval 95% confidence interval and 99% confidence interval so for 90% you know that it's uh, so for one standard deviation 1.6 per standard devi uh, 1.6 per standard deviation and 2.67 standard deviation 2.5 per standard deviation you know how much confidence intervals that is so as one general practice or general suggestion that i would give us to remember this values it, it is just three four values so i think it will be easier to remember so they can have not provided in exam sorry they will not provide in exam no, no, z table and t table no, no, they, they, will, they will provide if any problem is there regarding z table they will they will not they might not provide the entire table but they will okay. provide a range of values for a range of z what are the values you can prescribe that is the the only range of the value na yeah okay Uh, Ravindran is saying in the introduction part and review of literature part of this is we should write the work of the scientists and what already observed by the scientists. So how should we have to write our thesis if they are falling to plagiarism? So that is where quoting and plagiarism come. Uh, sorry, quoting and paraphrasing comes in. So you can't copy and paste the words as such, but you can say that in. Uh, so let's just say that my my name is Arjun. Uh, so uh, I am I am writing an article. Where uh, let's just say that uh, silver nanoparticles give a sensitivity of uh, 2.34 ampere per centimeter square. So I am writing I am writing this observation in my paper. Silver nanoparticles give a sensitivity of 2.34 ampere per centimeter square. So you want to uh, so you want to like take note note down this observation in your thesis. So you can write that Arjun et al. observed in this experiment that. Uh, silver nanoparticles had given a sensitivity of 2.34 ampere per centimeter square and then you after, at the end of the sentence you can cite my paper saying arjun et al 2024 so that is how you uh, don't fall to plagiarism basically you are quoting my work and basically, basically you are quoting my work in that place you are you are not saying that sent, you are not writing the sentence as if you did the work you are saying that someone else did the work and then they got this value now uh, on the other hand if you write that uh, uh, silver nanoparticles got a uh, silver nanoparticles had a sensitivity of 2 in your paper if you write silver nanoparticles have a sensitivity of 2.34 ampere per centimeter square without even citing then it comes as plagiarism because you are getting the sentence from another paper but you are not acknowledging the work of others then that comes as plagiarism uh what should be the size of abstract in terms of number of lines so you should not uh, write your abstract in terms of number of lines so you should write in usually there will be a word count so and that word count is prescribed by it differs from journal to journal a general a uh, word limit is from 200 to 300 words in one paragraph in a single paragraph 200 to 300 words your abstract must be there 
and i think nowadays they also many journals also ask for a concept figure highlighting what your work is in uh, highly uh, asking you to uh, explain your work in a single picture Okay then. So, we, I mean, the session is still eight thirty. So we can uh, uh, take the doubts later as well. So for now, I'll go on to discuss the problems for uh, week twelve, the last week. So we'll go now. Yeah. So first question: the term fabrication in the context of scientific misconduct means to fabricate an instrument that gives incorrect results, to make up fake data or results. a term related to the science of textile fabric to submit a paper to a fake journal so fabrication we know uh, we already know that so we have to like if you try to manipulate any existing raw data to give some uh, biased values or if uh, you basically you are basically fa fabricating the data so the right answer would be to option b to make up fake data results this is a multiple choice question so only one answer is correct Doubts? We'll move to the next uh, question. Question number two: Copying and pasting chunks of text from somebody else's work into a paper is uh, so. Yeah, this is also we we were extensively discussing it in the doubts session. So this is called plagiarism. So option D, plagiarism is the right answer. This is also an MCQ, so no other option is accepted. Yes, now other D option option D is correct. And one uh, major uh, hint or tips in uh, your final exam would be that you can easily identify which ones are MCQ and which ones are MSQ. Multiple choice, so you will get three types of questions: multiple choice, multiple select, and numerical answer question. Nats, NATs. So MCQs will have you can choose only one option. So if you try to choose any other option, the original option will be cancelled. so that will be in radio buttons so you can easily identify M mcqs uh, msq means multiple select questions so those will be in check boxes those will be in the form of check boxes like this one so here i can actually choose multiple options and all of them will be if you choose the second option the first option will remain chosen it will not be cancelled so in that option it means that you can choose multiple answers and all of them will be correct in the third uh, question type numerical answer questions nats you will not have options you will have a box where you have to do calculations in your paper and then write the final answer uh, in the box given using your keyboard most often uh, they will be asking in single decimal position or double decimal position so look at the question properly what decimal position they are asking and then answer the question accordingly if you are getting more than two decimals then you can round it off to two decimals and then write the answer Uh, Ravindran, distortion. Distortion means manipulation. So there's a difference between fabrication and manipulation. Fabricating is changing the data. Manipulation or distortion means changing the experimental conditions so that you get the data you want. So that is basically distortion. Okay. So we'll go on to the next question. Copying and pasting from one's own own one's own paper into another paper is called. This also we noticed. So under plagiarism itself, we have a separate category called self plagiarism, where you cite you where you copy text from your own work and then paste it. So now whether is correct as well. So option C is called self plagiarism. So I hope uh, no one has any. The Gupta, you have raised your hand. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Sorry, I didn't uh, notice it. So it was for earlier uh, question. Uh, Which question? That I asked about the abstract. Oh yeah. So yeah. you have uh, you have discussed already, sir. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. I'll lower your hand then. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move to the next question. Uh, question number four: 
after the publication of a paper, the raw data is no longer needed. The raw data may be needed if the dispute arises. The raw data should be discarded through a shelter. The raw data should be retained as long as possible. Uh, so yeah, the main after the, even after publishing a paper, we must be uh, keeping the raw data with us. With this, the purpose of keeping a raw data is that if some dispute happens later, the reviewer or the primary author can take out the data and discuss it with the reviewer, proofread the data once again, and then see if there is any malpractice or uh, miscommunication of data. So, option D, the raw data should be retained as long as possible. So, we'll go on to the next question. Question number five, the corresponding author. Uh, Arjun. Yes. Yes. The previous one is a multiple select, right? Uh, I think it's multiple choice. No, no, multiple select, right? Uh, I think more than one answer. Uh, fourth question. Yeah. One second. I'll, uh... No, I think it's multiple choice only. No, no, I'm just telling multiple select, like more than one answer. Uh, I mean, so no, no, actually in the NPTEL assignment, they have uh, given only one, so they have given the provision for only one correct answer. I, I get your point. So even the option B might be, option B I think is the correct answer, is it? Correct. Uh, I'm guessing B also. Yeah. So one of the reasons, yeah, B also, but that is not the only reason why you are having. Oh, uh, I mean, is it, is it showing MSQ for your user as well? Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, I think then there is some sort of change because for me it was showing MCQ only. That's why I went with D option. Then it should be B and D only. I'll rectify it and uh, upload it in properly in the Google Drive. So I I, I think uh, there is some change in the material between you and me. If it is an MSQ for the user, then the answer is B and D. The raw data may be needed if it dispute arises, and the raw data should be retained as long as possible. Main reason. Okay. So if it's an MCQ, then this going to be the only option because there are multiple purposes for a raw data. Raw data can also be used for a dispute. And if your juniors or people from your lab wants to use, uh, replicate the data for some other experiment, they can also use that data as well. That's why we have to have the raw data for as long as possible. So the final answer will be option D only. But it's a, if it's the MSQ, the option D will also hold true. I think the fault is from my side only. I'll, for me, it's showing MCQ only. That's why I went to the D. I'll correct it and upload the correct material in the Google Drive. Okay. Uh, but everyone is clear with whatever concept that we discussed in this question, right? The main purpose of main pur raw data has multiple purposes. One of the purposes to in case uh, to defend, defend your work in case of a dispute. The other cases for your uh, subsequent peers in your lab to use the data for their work as well. Use the raw data as groundwork for their research work. Okay then. So I'll move on to the next question. Uh, actually, uh, and uh, please correct me if uh, uh, I'm going wrong somewhere because uh, I think I might have the old material in some for some of the questions. So please correct me uh, if any changes are there in the material as well. So, fifth question, the corresponding author is, uh, this is a multiple choice question answer once again. The author who has maximum contribution to the work, the author who is responsible for answering all queries regarding the paper, the supervisor, the student. So, we all know the corresponding author is the one who will be uh, permanently in the lab. So, whatever mailing or whatever review or whatever uh, questions that are being asked to the uh, regarding the publication, it's the responsibility of the corresponding author to uh, get that communication first. He can then later pass it on to the primary author, the first author, who can then write the, I mean, they can discuss, among, discuss it among themselves and then come to the final conclusion and then write the answer and then upload it. So, but the corresponding author will be the one who will be staying in the lab 
for the longer time. Mostly he will supervise her. So he or she or they might should uh, be giving their name as the corresponding author so that they can get all the communication regarding the uh, article. So I hope everyone is clear with this question as well. So I will move on to the next question. Question number 6. The term predatory journal in place is an MCQ and we already discussed in the recap session as well. So predatory journal is any journal which will uh, use money to solve all kinds of publication related problems. They will so they'll just uh, pub publish papers for a fee. So they will just get money from you and then they will in turn they will publish your paper. So basically predatory journal, submitting a paper in a predatory journal is not a good scientific practice and uh, submitting a paper in a predatory journal will often uh, lead to disreputation of the authors as well as uh, in some years time they might also be redacted from the journal. Okay, we will move to the next question. Uh, deliberate omission of outliers from the data set amounts to. So yeah, this is, uh, this kinds of comes under distortion. So the best possible answer for this is possibly distortion only. I know that distortion kinds of uh, is similar to manipulation, but uh, here in my opinion this kind of uh, definition will probably suit more to distortion rather than fabrication. Yes. So deliberate omission means, means deliberate omission means you are uh, you, are, you are not taking the data into calculation. So let's just say that uh, so let's just say that I am calculating a length of something. Uh, let's just say that uh, uh, let's just say that I am calculating the weight of uh, I am doing experiments with four my moves four moves for an experiment. Let's just say that uh, I am injecting some drug and then I am observing whatever is happening to, happening to the mouse and in three uh, three moves out of the four moves I am getting whatever outcome that is favored to me and in one mouse I am not getting the favorable outcome I am getting a different outcome so if I decide to omit the data if I decided to neglect the data and then publish the data that I obtained only from the favorable moves then it is counts as omission because you are neglecting the data false uh, neglecting the unfavorable data that you are getting so that amounts to distortion because you are kind of manipulating the experimental conditions to uh, get only favorable outcomes. Uh, Kranti, you can go ahead. Uh, Kranti, uh, do you have a doubt? Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Sir, uh, manipulating the data set or manipulating the reading is a fabrication, na? fabrication of the uh, available reading or data. Then why no, it no. is distortion? No, no, no. That, that's, the, that's the main reason between main difference between fabrication and distortion. In fabrication, you have already obtained the data. You are just changing values and doing all the stuff. In okay. distortion, you are changing the experimental conditions so that you will get only favorable data. Okay, okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes. So let's just, uh, for example, okay, I, uh, I, if you give me a minute, I think I can give, come up with an example. Yes. Um, okay, let's just say, uh, consider that uh, we are kind of um, more, uh, Okay. Yeah, let's just say that we are uh, measuring uh, butterfly wingspan in certain ecosystems. So I am in Bangalore right. I am in Bangalore right now, and I want to measure the uh, butterfly ecosystem in but, but, sorry butterfly wingspan in certain ecosystems. So uh, I want to show them that in cold climates the wing will be shorter than the uh, hot climate. Butterflies in hot climates. Bangalore has a cold climate normally. So um, I will measure the wing length or wingspan of each of the butterfly and I will get some values and in some cases what I will do, uh, let's just say that I observe something, observe butterflies which have a very long wingspan, I don't want them, so uh, let's just say instead of 12, 
I get 18 centimeter. So if I just delete the 18 centimeter and put another 12 centimeter, that is called fabrication of data because I have already got the data, and then I have uh, I am deleting and I am like changing the value into something else which is more favorable. Favorable. So that causes as fabrication. In manipulation or distortion, what I can do is I can just choose a scale which will only measure shorter the uh, distance, or I can use Vernier calipers which does not have proper zero calibration. So my experimental instrument itself is wrong. So whatever data I will be getting, it will be favorable for me only. So that is manipulation or distortion. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes. But, but I uh, I hope that everyone is now uh, comfortable with the definition slash the difference between uh, the two terms fabrication, distortion and manipulation. If yes, uh, if yes, we can proceed now. Uh, even if no, we can discuss it later in the doubt session because the session is still open till 8.30 as well. Yes. So uh, I think after the seventh question, every, if, I mean, in between the fifth question was multiple select, but I think eighth, ninth, and tenth are all multiple select questions as well. So we'll go on to it. So question number eight, when you are asked to review a paper, the following are considered misconduct. So we learned about research misconducts as well. Out of the given options, we need to find out which ones are scientific misconducts. Discussing the content of the paper in your research group, uh, rejecting the paper and then carrying on that idea to publish your own paper, asking the author to cite your own papers, basing the review on the name and fame of the authors. So uh, we can go over the option one by one as well. Discussing the content of the paper in your uh, research group. Um, I don't think this is a uh, scientific misconduct as well. In fact, it counts as kind of openness. Um, rejecting the paper and then carrying out that idea to publish your own paper, this counts as scientific misconduct because uh, you are basically denying the authorship for your article uh, to whomever generated the idea. So that counts as scientific misconduct. Asking the author to cite your own papers. One, once again, unnecessary citation in any research article is not a good conduct, so it counts as misconduct. Basing the review on the name and fame of the authors. Once again, we should not be, we should be object, as objective as possible when it comes to scientific evaluation. So basing any review on name and fame of authors is not allowed. Yeah. So, but the correct options given here in the material are all the four. Uh, maybe because of uh, discussing the content of the paper in your research group might be considered confidential as well. Uh, that's why the first option might also be uh, scientific misconduct. Maybe, uh, maybe it's allowed to discuss the paper with the experimental group who was performing the experiment, but it may not be a good practice to discuss the confidential work with a research group. This option is kind of pretty vague, but I don't know why they have also included this option in the material. I'll go on now to the next question. The following amount to scientific misconduct. Uh, this is also a multiple select question. Uh, failing to realize that a systemic error is um, can, can we move to the last question? Yeah, yeah, we are going to, uh, Two more questions are left. Yeah. I'll just quickly uh, go over that. that. Uh, last question is the eighth question. Eighth question. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, so, this uh, fourth option, what is that actually means? So, basing the review on the name and fame of the author's fourth option. So, this actually means, like, the option basically means that let's just assume that you are a reviewer. You are getting some paper from a set of experimentalists, a set of researchers. You are seeing the paper and then you are looking at the author list. You are thinking that, okay, this guy is a very big shot in this area. So probably he might be correct or I don't want to face his uh, wrath or 
his problems while reviewing the paper. So I better accept whatever I am, uh, whatever work he is doing as correct work, and I publish it. So pretty, what you are doing in this case is you are basing the review purely based on whether he is a big shot or not. You would not have done the same thing if the corresponding author was not known that much. If he was not a big shot, you would have read the paper properly and you would have addressed the right claims that are uh, that seem problematic to you in the paper. But just because the corresponding author is a big shot, even if you find some problems in a paper, uh, either uh, Gupta is basing only. I mean, uh, I get your uh, grammatical this thing, but here it will come as basing only. It won't come as biasing. So your basing. I think sir, the biasing is a correct or relevant thing. Yeah, yeah. Biasing the review. Uh, means uh, review is biased, no? In that in that case, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the name and fame of the author. Yeah, yeah. That's so, why I I, so, I thought this. Yeah, yeah. So the total meaning of the expression is just bias only. But uh, grammar in grammatical context, both basing and biasing uh, makes sense. Both of them yes, almost yes. almost convey the same thing only. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, coming back to the. Uh, options definition so basically if you, i mean if yeah just because he is a big shot just because he is a very well known guy, uh, person uh, he or she or they is a very well known person in the field uh, you would you might not have the guts to ask him the correct claims uh, addressed in the research paper you might not uh, you might fear that maybe if we face this guy if we oppose, oppose this guy we might get a uh, negative criticism from other people in the same field so there's a lot of pressure in that situation. So what you will do is, as a psychological uh, biasing, we will come to the conclusion that okay, let's not let's just not come to any problems. We will just accept this paper. So that is that should ideally it is not uh, a good scientific practice. You should whoever it is, you should be in a position to uh, ask the right questions. or use your objective thinking and then ask the right questions to the person, whether or not they are a big shot or not. Okay, I can understand that uh, meaning, but my doubt is like uh, when the paper comes to a review, uh, the paper doesn't have any uh, like uh, name, right? No, no. So okay, the author can't name will be there. Uh, running out of bandwidth. I, I can't like your voice is fading. Can you repeat your? Uh, uh, okay, uh, what what like what I am telling if the paper sent for a review. Yes. Uh, is that uh, name of the authors will be mentioned for the reviewer or uh, it will so, be sent like a... No, no, that's the, so that's the difference actually. So not all journals receive articles in the same way. So there are journals which are double blind. So you might have seen in B10 lectures as well. So we have single blind and double blind uh, reviews and studies as well. So single blind is where you don't... Ah, exactly. See, Gupta, uh, Gupta's point is valid. So, author's name comes in single blind review. You might not know who, your paper, who is reading your paper, but the reviewer will know who you are in a single blind review. In a double blind review, both of you will not know, like you will also not know who is going to review your paper. The person who is reviewing your paper will also not know who you are. So, your question basically depends on what kind of journal you are submitting your article to, whether you are submitting it to a uh, you, whether you are submitting it for a single blind review or a double blind review. Yeah, okay. Okay. Does anyone have any other doubts uh, with respect to this question? Yes, Mahakali Sarita, you can. Mahankali Sarita, you can go ahead. Sir, in the ICT review, they said that you don't need to mention the author details. So, in sorry. the blank. Sorry, I can't hear you properly. Can you repeat your question? In the ICT conference paper, they said that no need to mention the author details. Oh, ICT conference, you need, you don't need to mention. Good, and that, that's actually a very good practice because it uh, allows the reviewer to choose your abstract only based on the content of your abstract, uh, not based on who you are or who your PI is. Should I move to that paper? Yes, that, that, that actually is a good practice and 
many people would be encouraged to do so. You will be encouraged to actually submit papers in that conference instead of any other journal as well. And finally, finally, when they publish your work, they will ask your author details and they will, they will publish it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, when there is no point of going back. So once after all the reviews are complete and the article is actually ready for publishing, then they, will ask, then they will ask the author details at which point you and your corresponding author might give your details for publishing it. Once up, one more doubt, sir. Actually, once we upload the paper in library conference, Okay. Uh, again, they ask uh, without the author details, you have to send them uh, the upload it. Okay. Uh, on the trip, can we send it like that? Uh, my, one of my colleagues said that uh, if you uh, send it like that, means uh, they put the author details in some other names. Don't send like that. Uh, so, yeah, so that's where, so that's where the transparency, openness, and integrity part of uh, um, research ethics comes in. So, uh, one thing is that you must also be, you, you must also be tracking your work at some points of time. If you see, if you notice someone is using your work to publish a paper, then you can, you need to like have, with, if you have proper evidence that you have submitted your paper to this conference at this time, and after six or seven months, I'm seeing this article in a different journal under a different author's name, you can publicly file a case against the authors and, and as well as the journal and as well as the conference's uh, organizers for failing to note that some other people have scooped your work. Okay. Yes, that actually parts of, comes as part of scientific integrity and uh, once the authors who take your work are found guilty, uh, the work will be return to you and you might be allowed to submit it in another, another journal. Yes. But, uh, I mean, uh, one, one major uh, uh, suggestion that uh, I would uh, like that I kind of got from my seniors and my professors uh, is that uh, don't reveal all the details details from your work uh, unless or until uh, your work is completely ready for publication. So uh, don't reveal key details from your work. Uh, reveal the details which uh, can be replicated very easily by other people only just for comp if you are submitting any work for the conference. In that way you won't lose any key data from your work. For example, if I am synthesizing for example, if I am synthesizing the molecule, I won't uh, necessarily reveal what molecule I am synthesizing. Rather, if I just uh, send the data of, let's just say, absorption spectrum of the molecule in UV region, then that, that data can be replicated by anyone. So, unless you have the molecule by yourself, unless I have given you the structure by myself, you can't replicate the synthesis of the molecule and you can't come up with the absorption spectrum. So, this structure of the molecule is a key detail and that I won't be sharing with, with anyone unless or until I publish the paper myself. So, okay. it is also mindful from the uh, author's side to not reveal key details while, uh, uh, while going for a conference or uh, a seminar unless or until they are sure that in, in a very short time that work will be published. I hope it's clear by now. Hello, sir. Yes, Adamodar. So basically, you are saying that uh, one should be able to replicate the procedure, but may not be able to get the same results for the uh, uh, means uh, researcher no, no, was getting. No, no, no. no that, that's the thing. That's the that that's the concept of replicability. Uh, that's the concept of repeatability and replicability. So uh, let's just say that you have published your work. Let's just say that you have given the structure of the molecule in the paper and then you have given all the absorption details and all those stuff. If one, one other guy decides to read that paper and then if one other guy decides to replicate that uh, molecule, since there is the molecule all by himself, he should also get the same data that you have got. That becomes part of replicability. There he is not stealing your work. Because your work is already published, he can't technically steal your work from that point. But let's just say that before publishing the paper, you involve in a discussion with him 
and he somehow gets to know the structure of a molecule and if he kind of uh, tries to synthesize it become successful and if he can obtain the same data he can publish the paper so that is basically stealing others work scooping others work so that is illegal that is not that is scientific misconduct repeatability is different from uh, stealing the work or scooping others work repeatability no. comes under total security of your data you are, you, no one can actually steal your data but you have given all the data to a specific journal where it is already published that is repeatability is just to make sure that uh, you know your, your data is uh, there is some specific amount of certain degree of integrity to your data that whatever experiment you have done it is believable that's why the repeatability is considered there yes sir yes okay. anyone has any other doubts okay then anyways we, i mean we uh, the, like i said we all, all always have the doubt session at the end of the uh, session as well so we'll move on to the next question the following amount to question number 9 the following amount to scientific misconduct it's a msq failing to realize that a systemic error has got into the measurements uh, removing those data points that contradict the scientist hypothesis conducting an experiment aiming at establishing one's personal belief choosing the experimental group and control group potentially without randomization so uh, there are a lot of options here which amount to scientific misconduct and out of those these three are the like the last three options b c and d are the uh, actual true options for scientific misconduct so let's just go over those options one by one choosing the experimental group and control group potentially without randomization this actually amounts to scientific misconduct because once again this amounts to this amounts to this actually is manipulation of data or distortion of data basically you are uh, setting the experimental conditions in such a way that you will get favor favorable data so whatever experimental group and control group you are devising designing it should be random all the subjects in that experimental and control group should be random it should not be preferred in such a way that you will get favorable data so the fourth option d is scientific misconduct conducting an experiment aiming at establishing one's personal belief once again manipulation or distortion just in a more general sense scientific misconduct removing those data points that contradict the scientist hypothesis omission of data once again distortion failing to realize that a systematic error has got into the measurements this might actually not be scientific misconduct because you are not consciously making any uh, error in this case this uh, if people realize that the whatever error you have got is a random error and not a human biased error then it is not scientific misconduct it is random error so failing to realize that systematic error has got to the measurement means it's not a scientific misconduct but it is always general, general practice that whenever you are performing an experiment whenever you are getting data it is always important to validate your data with peers your lab mates as well as with your supervisors uh, you can discuss it with your peers who aren't directly involved with your project or directly involved with your area of research and you can discuss it with your uh, pa who will help you uh, clean the data properly so this will not fall into scientific misconduct so i hope uh, i am clear right now like do you will have any doubts with this question yeah gupta you can go ahead sir me my view about this question 9 number question is uh, if something we are doing intentionally hmm. then it may be a misconduct i think because the first one yes. is uh, which is not in our intention ah, not in so that's why we are misconduct yes uh, that, that that's why be, it is not there should be sufficient evidence so in so all three cases uh, it is showing uh, we are doing something intentionally yeah exactly exactly so something yes. which is some, something which is not intentional is not scientific misconduct but you should also have su sufficient proof to say that it's random 
So, uh, like we discussed in the previous classes, there are certain tests to prove that some observations are not part of, that are random and are random errors and not humanized errors, like chi square test example. So, there should be sufficient evidence to prove that whatever uh, wrong measurement or systematic error that you have got is completely random and not entirely caused by you. Yes, sir. Yes. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sure. Okay, then. So we'll move to the last question. The following practices are not considered scientific misconduct. So this is not considered scientific misconduct. This is a multiple select question. Publishing one scientific work in newspapers without publishing in peer-reviewed journals. Copying and pasting from one's own papers. We'll go over the options one by one. So publishing one scientific work in newspapers without publishing in peer-reviewed journals. So newspapers don't go through the same scientific rigor or scientific process that compared to scientific journals. So publishing your work in newspapers compared to journals is not a, a ethical thing to do. So this is scientific misconduct. So this is not the correct option. Here they are asking not consider scientific misconduct. So you should, whatever option you are choosing, it should be ethically correct. Second option, copying and pasting from one's own papers to the same person's PhD thesis. This amounts to self plagiarism. This is also not a, this is also a scientific misconduct. A wrong result obtained due to an inadvertent programming error. So, so yeah, unintentionally you have done some programming error and due to that you have obtain some uh, wrong uh, result. So, since you are doing it un unintentionally, this is not considered scientific misconduct. So, this is the correct option. Deliberately stating measured values without error bars. So, this is a very vague answer. It depends on the number of observations that you have done. So, if your number of observations is only one, then you can't put error bars. You have only one value. Only if you do three uh, only if you do two or three or multiple observations about a single variable, then only you can put error bars. So, okay. Correct. So, correct option is copying. Okay, copying and pasting from one's own papers under the same PhD thesis. Okay. Uh, okay. For PhD thesis, okay. So, in this case, yeah, uh, you can't pay, copy and paste from your own paper to another paper manuscript, but you can cite it from a PhD thesis because. Uh, your thesis is your own work and it is not a scientific publication per se but it's an open copy for everyone to see so once again uh, you can't like you can kind of quote your own cite your own paper and then say that say that you have done this and you have mentioned this in this paper so in that case copying and pasting from one, your own paper to your thesis is admitted but copying and pasting from your paper to another paper is self plagiarism So uh, that's all the questions I have for this week. I'll go over the uh, options one by one from the first for people who have joined. Uh, Arjun, this yes, last yes. tenth one. Yeah. Uh, so the last options also holds good, right? That uh, deliberately stating measured value without error bars. Yeah. So that's what I said. It's a very, it's, it's kind of a very vague option to so say. So, that is not a scientific misconduct only if you have a single observation. But then again, a single observation is not, uh, should not be uh, considered as an absolute truth. Uh, normally, you should, consider, it should take multiple observations and you must take the, uh, in the, you should take the average and single deviation of it. So, that's, I think that's what they mean by this option. Oh, okay. So I'll go over the options one by one. So the term fabrication in the context of question number one, the term fabrication in the context of scientific misconduct means option B to make up fake data or results. Question number two, copying and pasting chunks of text from somebody else's work onto a paper is option uh, D called plagiarism. Mahan Kali Sarita, you can go ahead. Okay, first. First question answer is option B to make up fake data or results. Okay. Uh, question number two is called plagiarism. Uh, question number three, copying and pasting from one's own paper into another paper is called self plagiarism. 
Question number four, after the publication of a paper, uh, option number uh, four, the raw data should be retained as long as possible because the raw data comes for multiple purposes, uh, for dispute as well as for reusing. Fifth question, the corresponding author is option B, the author who is responsible for answering all queries regarding the paper. Option six, the term predatory journal implies. Option C, a journal that publishes papers for a fee with practically no review. Option, uh, question number seven, deliberate omission of outliers from the data set amounts to option C, distortion. Question number eight, when you are asked to review a paper, the following are considered misconduct. All the options here are valid, uh, discussing the content, rejecting the paper and carrying out that idea, asking the author to cite your own papers, basing the review on the name and fame of the authors. All the options are correct. Question number nine, the following amount to scientific misconduct. Except for the first option, all of the options are correct. Removing the data points, uh, one step, conducting a experiment aiming at one's personal belief, choosing experimental group and control group preferentially random, rather than randomly. And the final question, the following practices are not considered scientific misconduct. So option number B, copying and pasting from one's own papers into the same person's PhD thesis. And option C, a wrong result obtained due to an inadvertent programming error. So both the options are done. So that's all the questions that I have. So yeah, Gupta, you can go ahead. Uh, sir, can we have some more discussion on question number four? Question number four. One second. It's a select the question, sir. Sorry, sorry, I can hear you, Sarita. Engineering the fourth question is by the selection of the Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 actually. So, sorry, 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 everyone. Uh, yeah, fourth question is also an MSQ. After the publication of paper, the raw data may, uh, both options, B, uh, we already discussed this in the fourth question as well. The raw data may be needed if a dispute arises. And option D, the raw data should be retained as long as possible. All, both options hold. Sorry, sorry. I uh, we will discuss this half an hour ago as well. Yes. Can you repeat it so, once sir? So what is the uh, actual answer for this question number four? Actual answer will be option B and option D. Option B, the raw data. May option be B, B also. Yeah, B also. A raw data may be because uh, uh, sir, because it is also relevant to this. Uh, in fact. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So actually. Uh, uh, that's why. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no, actually I have the old material, the old material this question is an MSQ and only one option holds true, but in the new material it's okay. an MSQ, so both these options hold true. Uh, right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Sure, sure. Uh, Sarita, you have any... Sorry? 61, sir. 61 is a predatory journalist option C. A journal that publishes papers for a fee with practically no review. Okay. So yeah, we have now come to the doubt session of this uh, week. Um, so any other doubts uh, apart from the ones that we have discussed already, you can uh, ask here. Uh, the session is open till 8.30. If no one has any doubts, we can wrap it up by 8. Or if you can, the session is open till 8.30. We can discuss some more questions. And uh, one more important announcement is that, so as I mentioned in the starting of this session, this session is a kind of an extra session. So apart from today's session, I will be conducting the usual Saturday session tomorrow as well. The only difference is it will be in the instead of uh, 3 to 5, 3, I usually conduct it from 3 to 5 pm. Instead of that, I will be conducting it from 11 am to 1 pm in the morning. And uh, I, as usual, I will be recording and uploading uh, today's session as well as tom tomorrow's session in YouTube as well. And uh, you can access these videos in the problem solving session as assessments in the sidebar of the course. Yes. So now I'll open the uh, doubts, uh, room for doubts.
can discuss till 8.30. If no one has any doubts, we'll wrap it up early. Yes, yeah, Sarita, you can go ahead. Tomorrow we can discuss all the sessions, sir, week 1 to week 12. Sorry, sorry. Tomorrow, 11 to 1 p.m. we can discuss one, week 1 to week 12. Yes, yes, yes. So, tomorrow, uh, so tomorrow's uh, session is just a week. It's just a course recap. It's not any week recap. Since we have already completed all the 12 weeks' uh, content, tomorrow's con uh, session will sort of just be an extra session. So, we will be covering... We, I'll just be giving a brief recap of all the content that we have from week 1 to week 12 and then we will be discussing uh, probably one more problem from each week uh, any important problem from each week If uh, one more thing is there, let's just add that to the uh, yeah, total focus on problematic session no? Sorry, sorry If one more thing is there, let's just focus on but I had some we focused on uh, problematic sessions. Okay. We can also, uh, any session for exam preparation, I mean, tomorrow's session, I can, so if you, if you people have any suggestions on what kind of questions to prepare for, maybe I can prepare the questions for tomorrow's session as well. So what, uh, if you just uh, ask what kind of questions you want to discuss more, uh, in tomorrow's session, I can prepare the questions accordingly and then bring it for discussion. Oh, problem yes. or discussion. Else, if you people don't have any suggestions, I will sort of prepare uh, one one question or two two questions from each week, each week's content, and then I, I will equally distribute all the questions from each week, and then we will discuss it for two hours. That will be my general plan. Apart from the recap, content recap that we had, had that I will be explaining for the first two, uh, all the twelve weeks. So tomorrow's uh, bottom line is, or final bottom line is, tomorrow's session is a very general session. It will not be a week oriented session. It will be a general session where I will be covering almost all the weeks. So you people be free to uh, demand or suggest whatever content you want for tomorrow as well. I am free to take suggestions and I will prepare my content accordingly. So tomorrow's session is the last one session? The tomorrow session will be the last session. It will be the 13th session. Uh, it will be the last session before your exam. I think mm -hmm. your exam is on April 27th, right? Yes, sir. Yes. So this will be the last session before the... Because I think uh, we are not supposed to conduct any sessions after April 13th, actually. April 13th or April 14th, uh, we should be wrapping up our uh, all of our sessions by then. So tomorrow will be my last session. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, tomorrow's session seems exciting. Emphasis more on numerical type questions. Definitely, yeah. As I think uh, week 6 to week 10 will focus more, I mean, we uh, focuses more on numerical answers. So, yes, uh, I mean, compared to theory, I think I'll bring in more numerical questions. Maybe. Sure, sure, sure. Any other doubts you have, you can ask now, or any other suggestions you have for tomorrow's uh, doubt session, you can post it in the chat box. Uh, sir, tomorrow's session's uh, recording will be available, no? Uh, to tomorrow, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Tomorrow's session will be available only. We, uh, today is uh, because uh, I may be due to some. Uh, I mean, uh, the, unavoidable the, circumstances, I am not able to attend your tomorrow's session. It's, it's fine. That's it's, why I was asking. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. I may take a bit of time to upload it. Probably by Tuesday or Wednesday, I'll try to upload it. Uh, but it will be uploaded. Today's and tomorrow's session will be uploaded for sure. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. 6, 7, 8, please focus. Yeah, yeah, yes, sure. I think many people would want to focus on 6, 7, 8, 1, D because it has a lot of problems. Uh, no problem, we'll discuss it. Okay then, so if uh, no one has any more doubts, uh, we will sort of uh, conclude our session here. Uh, yes, once again, so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, to the session. It was a 
it was a lot informative to both the, both of us or all of us uh, while reading some doubts are raised as in i don't get it uh, sarita uh, then you will be sending link right Oh, shall we mail to you? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. My contact details are wherever given in uh, all the big slides, actually. So we can mail. And if you have any other doubts after the all the problem solving assessments, so you can either mail me or you can post all the doubts in the. Yes, you can either mail me or you can post it in the Google groups where uh, any one of the TAs will be free to answer your doubts. Uh, if you have no, to, uh, if you have tomorrow case, session uh, that link will be sent right is it, it will be the same link it will be the same link as this one for today's link yes yes it, it is i mean i we are pretty much using the same link for all the sessions oh, okay. week, right? uh, i have mentioned my email in the chat box i will pin it as well So this will be a mail ID. Uh, if uh, you are not comfortable with sending mails, you can also ask your questions through the Google groups, where I will be free to answer your questions or doubts. Okay then. So uh, if uh, no one has any more. Uh, doubts i'll kind of uh, close the session now uh, once again i thank you all for coming um, we'll see i'll see you guys tomorrow uh, from 11 am to 1 pm in the morning and it will not be the usual session from 3 pm to 5 pm it will be from 11 am to 1 p 1 pm you will get the mail sooner or later regarding the timing of the session and the meet link yes. until then see you thank you Yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> All the best as well for uh, those who cannot attempt to uh, come tomorrow to the session. Yes, I hope uh, the TA sessions were uh, useful as well to thank the exam. <laughs>